Hi, my name is Dr. Franz Cronier, and welcome to another episode of our Dan Education Series. And what we will be discussing specifically here is the question on the lips of those who are divers who have suffered COVID infections or may still in the future be subject to COVID infections. What are the implications and recommendations in terms of return to diving? That is what this edition is going to try to address. On the 31st of December 2019, an unusual form of pneumonia was identified in the Chinese city of Wuhan. By the 8th of January, the Chinese Center for Disease Control and Prevention had identified that it was attributed to a coronavirus, which belongs to the family of viruses associated with a common cold. But this virus caused far more illness and far more severe complications. The virus itself became known as Severe Acute Respiratory Syndrome Coronavirus 2. That's quite a mouthful. And the disease became known as COVID-19. Since this first discovery, COVID-19 has spread around and was officially labeled a pandemic in 2020. It was anticipated that between 25 to 35 percent of patients would need active medical intervention and there was a scramble to make sure that medical resources would be available to try and keep up with this. As it happened, some facilities were overrun with patients whereas others saw relatively few cases. It has been and remains an enigmatic illness and a very unpredictable disease. Now, not long after patients were being admitted and treated and some already had recovered, it was discovered that those who were older than 60 and those who also had comorbidities, things like hypertension, cancer, HIV or other forms of immunosuppression were particularly vulnerable and therefore had poorer outcomes. Fatality rates on patients who deteriorated to the point where they needed mechanical ventilation at one stage reached 80%, meaning that 8 out of every 10 on the ventilator died. Various methods were therefore sought and developed to try and extend the means of providing oxygen without needing to resort to mechanical ventilation, leaving that literally only as the last desperate effort. At the time of preparing this talk, that is on the 11th of May 2021, more than 160 million cases of COVID-19 had been reported, with 1% of them occurring in South Africa. Globally, 3.3 million people have died due to COVID-19 and its complications, with 55,000 of these coming from South Africa. The good news, though, is that 130 million people have recovered from COVID-19, with one and a half million of these being from our country. So there's hope. As far as scientific and medical investigation goes, it's almost incredible that by today's date, 91,000 scientific articles have already been published in peer-reviewed journals. So we're talking about official scientific documents attempting to describe the features not only of COVID-19's respiratory presentation, but the various other aspects that were not anticipated and still seem to boggle the mind from day to day as we continue to learn 
the complications that may arise. Further and further treatments have been sought and ultimately a prevention, if possible, would be a ideal solution. Whether we will achieve that point is not known at this stage. What we do know is that there are already 15,000 review articles and various meta-analyses on the different aspects of the disease. Now, as far as our members and divers are concerned, four articles have addressed diving-specific related issues. And, in fact, the various international undersea and hyperbaric medical associations have themselves uh, promulgated position statements, given advice to patients, doctors, in an ever-evolving series of protocols for better quarantine, isolation, admission, the criteria for referral to ICU, discharge, and, of course, the potential for vaccination with all its challenges. And these are appearing almost daily. Now an unanticipated finding was that much of the morbidity associated with COVID-19 was due to an immune response called the cytokine storm. Basically that means that the proteins and the various mechanisms in our bodies were hyperstimulated in an effort to eradicate the infection. With this came an increase in coagulation of blood and a disruption of many organs as well as deep venous thrombosis and thromboembolism. It was also discovered that not only the lungs but the heart and even the brain could be particularly at risk. Another surprising finding was that many patients who had suffered from the disease and recovered now started suffering new symptoms such as brain fog, cognitive deficits, memory loss and impaired general fitness. The bottom line is that resilience and full recovery remain an ongoing concern and are really the questions that we are asking in terms of return to diving. The classical signs of abnormal or loss of smell and taste did not necessarily always occur and if they did, did not always recover fully. The bottom line is that there is still much to be learnt about COVID-19 and the information we are giving you today is based on what we know at this time. Fortunately though, there is a significant amount of evidence that does make us confident in making certain recommendations relevant to both the recreational and commercial diving sector for those who've recovered from COVID-19. These recommendations are summarized in an article which we'll provide you via link and you're able to read it up for yourself but we'll be summarizing the findings by Sadler et al the authors and their categorization of the severity of the illness. Now Sadler made use of four categories of severity of COVID-19. These allow us to provide better guidance, more consistent advice and targeted examinations and criteria for individuals wishing to return to diving or in fact even back to work. The Sadler grading is as follows. Grade naught individuals include those who either have not suffered COVID-19 or have only discovered coincidentally by means of a blood test that they have had COVID-19 and never knew it. So these are essentially asymptomatic individuals. Grade 1 are the mild COVID-19 cases, which means they are the ones that were able to manage at home in self-quarantine. The Grade 2 cases were moderate in terms of severity, 
and represent those that had to be admitted to hospital for varying periods of time to receive supplemental oxygen with or without findings on chest x-rays that suggested that there was lung damage. But the admissions were never extended and they never needed ventilation or admission to ICU or significant clotting disorders. Which leaves us with the last category which is grade 3. These were the individuals who required admission not only to hospital but often to ICU for ventilatory support and those that suffered cardiac, neurological or significant clotting derangements. So just to summarize that because it's quite a mouthful. Grade 0 asymptomatic individuals. Grade 1 able to remain in self uh, quarantine and not needing oxygen. Grade 2 those that did need medical intervention in the form of oxygen supplementation and grade 3 individuals who required intensive care and or had significant damage to their heart, brain and possibly other organs in addition to the lungs. So with that as a backdrop, let's return to the original question. How do we decide or how could we decide whether it would be safe to return to diving? Well, there is an approach that we use when determining fitness for work in general and it is useful to be applied here. Firstly, we must weigh up the ability of the individual to perform all the essential and emergency functions of diving and maintain energy output levels of at least 6 METs, which is 6 times baseline metabolic expenditure. This would be the case for recreational divers. For commercial divers, it would be 10 METs. So ability is the first consideration. Then follows resilience. It's all very well being able to do something once, but are you able to do it day after day, week after week? And so resilience is another important aspect that needs to be considered. And could the individual who suffered COVID-19 maintain their exercise and energy levels commensurate with the demands of the sport or commercial activity on a daily basis? And thirdly, there should be the assurance that the individual would not be putting either themselves or others at undue risk. Now, how do we make this practical? Well, the following guidance can be derived from these criteria or the different grades. For grade naught individuals, these individuals would be filling in their RSTC or diving medical questionnaire and not even indicate that they had any symptoms or any respiratory illness. They might make a casual comment that it was discovered that they had a positive blood test but they never had any evidence of the disease otherwise. For these individuals it would be a very simple matter to return to diving. And in fact, they would probably not even know that it was necessary or could possibly pose a problem. But grade one individuals would be individuals or patients knowing they had suffered from COVID-19. These are the ones that were mild and could be managed at home, did not require oxygen, but nevertheless needed to remain isolated and away from other uh, healthy individuals for at least two weeks after which the symptoms cleared or were busy clearing and they certainly were no longer infective. These would typically then complete the RSTC form indicating that they had suffered a respiratory illness or specifically COVID-19. These individuals should be examined preferably by a diving medical practitioner, should undergo stress ECG testing, not only 
to determine whether their cardiac function is normal, but also that their exercise capability was acceptable. In other words, six mets for recreational divers and 10 mets for commercial divers. They should have normal spirometry and an X-ray of the chest should not show any abnormalities. These individuals would have no reason to be barred from diving after two weeks of recovery. The grade two individuals are those that needed oxygen and therefore by definition had some respiratory compromise. These individuals have been advised essentially as a baseline for not returning to diving for at least three months after recovering from their symptoms and they should then undergo the same battery of examinations that the grade one patients did. In other words, they would undergo stress ECG testing and spirometry as well as a chest x-ray. If abnormalities were found, then these would then require further investigation and the outcome of that would determine whether or not they would be fit to dive. For grade three individuals, in other words, those who were seriously ill and required admission that was lengthy or involved ICU and even ventilatory support are advised to discontinue diving for at least six months, followed by very, very specific pulmonary and cardiac testing, including possibly CT of the lung, that's computer tomography, as well as a PHS X-ray. And if these show abnormalities, then further decision making would be required as to whether this would pose a risk. They also would need to perform the exercise ECG but together with echocardiography to show that the heart was pumping normally and that they were able to maintain adequate fitness and energy output levels. Okay, so if abnormalities are found and individuals are not fit to dive at that stage, we suggest, if they wish to, that they should be reassessed with the same battery 12 months after the initial assessments. It is possible that recovery can occur because there are already cases in which such recovery has been documented. In addition, there are several medications on the market that would be appropriate if there were clotting abnormalities and are not as fickle as uh, Coumadin or Warfarin, which requires very, very careful scrutiny and can sometimes lead to complications. So that really ends this education piece. We're not getting into the vaccination pros and cons at this stage because that's a whole nother article, but we hope that it's provided you with some reassurance and guidance in terms of returning to diving after suffering COVID-19. As a precautionary note again, please remember this is the best current evidence now. In the future, there may be additional information that will allow us to make further refinements. But this is what we are able to offer you today. I encourage you to look at the article and please pose your questions if you have uh, additional areas of concern for which you need more specific answers.